they came back like a few months later and they're like, well, would you want to have like a production company under our umbrella? And I was like, Oh, I think I like accidentally played like hard to get and it worked. (laughs) (laughs) That Um, is not normal. Hey everyone. I'm Morgan Debon, a passionate entrepreneur and life advisor. With the journey podcast, you'll discover that success isn't about the destination. It's about the journey. I'm sharing stories of amazing people who've taken control of their lives. Join me on my own journey to discover the secret sauce behind reaching success with permission from no one else. Welcome back to the Journey Podcast. I'm so excited today because we are talking all things being a creative entrepreneur and building an empire. I'm here with the fabulous Phoebe Robinson. You know her, you love her. And if you don't know her and love her, you will by the end of this podcast, okay? So Phoebe, welcome to the Journey Podcast. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm I'm really excited to be here. And I do love that. I know people can't see, but the, the painting in the background is delicious. So yes, yes. Um, this does go out on YouTube and on Instagram. This painting okay, is from Ghana. You can kind of see, you've been to Ghana, so you can see like- <clears> I've never been to Ghana. Ghana. No, oh, it's on the go. list. December, 30 December. Oh, that's the best time to go. So much okay. fun. Go for okay. Afro Future, formerly Afro Cella. It's so fun. But yes, this is from Market, an amazing artist there. And then this is a family heirloom. So yes, if you are listening to this, and you don't know what I'm talking about. Go to YouTube and subscribe. Thank you. <laughs> Anywho, so for those people who aren't familiar, how do you describe yourself? Like I had my intro for you and I was like, I don't know if this does her justice. Like, <laughs> you're such a multi-hyphenate. Like, people want to be a multi-hyphenate so bad, but I feel like you truly embody that essence. Yeah. Um, and I, I have to say, not everyone needs to be a multi-hyphenate. Mm. I think that is, um, I think people place pressure on themselves to be able to do all the things. And because I think, you know, there's so much of like, this person's a genius, that person's a genius because they could do X, Y, and Z. And then it's always like smoke and mirrors when you like really look up close. You're like, oh, they have tons of help. And it's, they're not just like magically creating everything themselves. Um, so that's just a bit of a side. But I guess I would describe myself. I am clearly born and raised, but I, you know, I feel like I'm a New Yorker. I moved here, um, you know, 17 going on 18. So mm-hmm. I've been here like 22 years. Wow, yeah, that's a lifetime. <laughs> yeah, so I feel like I'm definitely a New Yorker at this point. You know, uh, I'm a bibliophile. I love comedy. I think I'm a writer first. Like that is just if I could only do one thing mm. for the rest of my life, it would be to write, but you know, I do stand up, I act. Mm-hmm. I'm a TV producer, publisher, even Yeah, I have a book in print called Tiny Reparations Books. I have a production company called Tiny Reparations. I just love to create and collaborate and I am a super YouTube fan. So Mm. I think that that (laughs) New York Times bestselling author, whatever. Like I just, I like to create, I like to, to build worlds. I think, you know, I just have always been someone who's just loved storytelling, who's loved reading books as a kid. And so I just like to carry on that tradition and then hopefully like help other people be able to do the same. Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, you really are living everyone's dream outside looking at. So how does it feel? <laughs> oh, I'm also a runner. I just went, I forgot to add that. I'm, I'm now technically an athlete, uh, not a paid Incredible. one. Yeah, <laughs> not, <laughs> not a paid one, just as a hobby. I feel like I, I know like you, you, you see someone achieve a certain amount of success, you probably think like, oh, they have it made and blah, blah, blah. And this is not to say that my life is not great because it is like I have wonderful friends and family, but I always feel like, you know, I'm a little bit of a work in progress. You know, Mm. I feel like whether it's like professionally or personally, I liken it to like how I approach stand up where I just, I'm just a scientist in a lab, just constantly tweaking, moving things around, seeing what fits and what doesn't. I think that's a lot of what my life is, is that I'm just always sort of trying to figure out like what works best, how I can grow as a person, but I will say things are good. I mean, I'm I'm friends with Bono, and if you would have told that's pretty cool. I saw that on your Instagram this morning. Yeah, like, yeah. And if you would have told 13 year old Phoebe that she would be friends with one of her heroes and on the board of his nonprofit charity, I would be like, 
What are you talking about? What are you saying? (laughs) (laughs) Get out of here. (laughs) I love that for you. So let's just walk back for, you know, the podcast is called The Journey. And I try to talk to people about how we got to where we are today. Mm -hmm. What was your first inflection point in your perspective? Like, what was the thing that you feel like started the momentum Mm -hmm. to create space for all of these opportunities for you? That's a, your, your, your word choice game is really strong. I really appreciate it. Um, well, I would say probably 2008, Mm. I was an executive assistant to the head of Picture House, which was an indie company. It folded, but I believe it's now back, but I was working there and I think I always secretly wanted to be, you know, a performer. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I just had the courage to admit it to myself. So I was like, oh, I'll just be like a writer producer and I'll work my way up in the film industry and like gain all this experience because I'm very much, I'm very much a person which I don't even want to make this a generational thing. I think it's just a people thing. People constantly are like trying to find shortcuts to like move around things. I'm always like, but you learn when you do the things like, me being an assistant has been the greatest asset in terms of my career. So anyway, I was a executive assistant. I wasn't really loving the job. It was just kind of like, it was a lot of hours. You know, you're like in your twenties, a lot of hours. You live in New York, you're working overtime, you're still broke. (laughs) It's like, where's all my money going? (laughs) And my good college friend, she was also a writing major at Pratt uh, Institute. She was like, hey, I want to take like a stand-up class. And I was like, what? Wait, <laughs> that sounds so dumb. And she was like, but I don't want to take it by myself. It'd be so fun if we did it together. And I was like, stand-up is, you know, like, listen, I, you know, I knew about Margaret Cho, Chris Rock, yeah. Wanda Sykes, but I was just like, what is stand-up? This is like, isn't like a real thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it feels like far-fetched over there. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, that's like not even a real career. Like, what are you doing? And she was like, well, you, you don't like your job. Let's just go do it. It's at Caroline's, RIP mm-hmm. Caroline's on Broadway. She's like, it's eight weeks. And like, it'll just be fun, distraction while, you know, like you figure out like what you want to do because you don't like your job. And I was like, all right, sure. Like, let's go ahead and do it. Mm-hmm. And the first thing our class did was we saw Daryl Hammond, who used to be on SNL. He did like a, he headlined at Caroline's. And I was like, oh my God, this is like so fun. Like you see the audience laughing and feeling the energy. You're like, oh, yeah. this is like super cool. And so then our assignment was to like write like three minutes of stand up. And mm-hmm. we, Lindsay and I were like, three minutes? Well, like, yeah. we're yeah. like, what? <laughs> <laughs> we're like oh my god that's so much time yeah. and so you know her and I met up after work and we wrote like a little joke yeah. and then we go to our class and it's sort of like you know it felt like it was like an AA room it was just like a, you know like a half circle or like some donuts in the corner and there was like a little you know mic stand and mic or whatever and our teacher was Linda Smith who's a great great Boston comic came up with like Dennis Leary and a lot of those mm-hmm. guys Lenny Clark. Um, and the second I touched the microphone, I was like, oh, I think I'm supposed to be doing this. Like, you know, I just feel like I can be very in tune with like the universe and like what my yeah. gut or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so it just was like, you know, I told my jokes. I think I got like a couple laughs, you know, whatever. It's totally fine. And I was just like, this feels like mm. I'm on to something, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And so that like really changed the trajectory. So that was July 2008 when we started the class. And then Picture House got shut down in October 2008. And mm-hmm. I was like, that's a sign. I was like, yeah. I think that's a sign I'm supposed to do this. So I was just doing like open mics and bringer shows where a bringer shows where you basically bring people in exchange for you know stage time Mm -hmm. so for instance if you want to perform at like gotham comedy club you have to bring like 10 people and you would get like seven minutes i love that yeah so you would like do all that stuff i used to bark outside of uh you You know bark yeah so that's where you like have like flyers you'd be like oh like seinfeld might drop in tonight and seinfeld's not dropping in tonight (laughs) He's, he's not. <laughs> you like the night lady on the street? Yeah. So you're like, oh, it's going to be a great show. And just be like me and my friends. And it would just be like us, like, you know, basically we'll taking turns doing <laughs> stand up. And I would go to open mics where it's like, you know, you pay like maybe five bucks. You like buy a soda. You get to like 
work out like five minutes material. So like just all these things where I was just sort of like doing the work. Yeah. Doing the work. And I like just went to a deep dive. And this was back when like Comedy Central used to air stand up specials all the time. I do not know what happened to that network. But <laughs> so they would like air like Comedy Central half hours at yeah. like, you know, like one in the morning. I know that right. I sound old, but I would like set my yeah, I mean I was a part of the tip <laughs> generation. We remember yeah. waking up staying up and being like, what's all this programming that happens late at night? Yeah. So I would like get my D V R and I would like record the sets. And yeah. so then I will watch them in the morning as I was getting so ready to good. go to work. Like I would watch all the HBO half hours so I just really dove in hung out at clubs and that I just really feel like that just changed everything because I was just I like to be a student right I also am high achieving so I like to be proficient at things but I really love to learn Mm because I'm just I'm always like you never know what things you'll like add to your toolkit and Mm -hmm. I so I just really dove in yeah that resonates with me I think I was very similar when I started Blavity I didn't know anything about being an entrepreneur, being a venture backed founder in Silicon Valley and raising money. And I did the same thing. I hit the pavement. I went to every happy hour in San Francisco. I talked to every Uber driver and Lyft driver who had an app. I took coffee dinners and lunches and just read all the blogs, you know, Y Combinator, which is a huge accelerator, read their blog, TechCrunch, anything I could get my hands on to just understand the world and the vocabulary and just like in some ways, I was also looking for people of color who were successful, which I didn't find many of them, like a handful in, of our generation. And yeah. But I think that so often because of social media, people forget that like a lot of the people that we see being successful and like getting to these next levels really spent like time, like grunt hours. Like it's the 10,000 hour rule. It's like you really had to spend time doing it. And I don't know if it feels like this to you, but for me, it feels like people really do want to skip that part right now. Like people are looking and they're comparing and they're like, why is this so like, how did Phoebe get here? Like, I'm, I'm just as funny as her, you know? And it's like, (laughs) it's a little more than just about being funny. (laughs) Yeah. 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 It's definitely like, I think to compare is to despair. And I do that from time Mm -hmm. to time. So I don't want to act like I'm immune to it, but I do think there is something if you look at like an Ali Wong, you know, mm-hmm. like she has been doing comedy for a long time, longer than yeah. I have. And I remember when she, she used to live in New York and I had this like, <laughs> this crummy little like bar show at Manchester pub, which is no longer around, but it was like Midtown Manhattan. Mm-hmm. It was a Monday show during Monday night football and it had a microphone, like a crappy little speaker I got from like PC Richards and Son. Oh my God, so <laughs> and like she would do the show and I like couldn't afford to pay people. So I would pay them in like free chicken wings. and <laughs> <laughs> That's what it takes. Yes. And like you look at her now, she's like having all the success stand up wise and with beef oh and everything. Yeah. And it, with her stand up, it's like she was a comic. Even when I knew her back then, she was getting up every night she was tweaking her jokes all the time that's right and so for me to see her have this massive success where she's like selling out theaters and doing i think she did like a 10 night residency at like beacon theater new york i'm like yeah she's put in the like 15 years to have this and so i think people to your point, get very sort of distracted by social media because I think everyone only just posts the highlight reels. They never yeah. like post like, you know, the the losses. And so I think a lot of people just are like, well, I want this to happen overnight for me. And I'm like, there are a handful of people where it's like, you know, they just have magic dust. They have fairy dust sprinkled upon them. And like, you know, you hear about like those actors and actresses who they're just discovered like at a mall, you mm-hmm. know, and they're just so captivating. And someone's like, you should act. And they, oh, it's on you. And then they like go out for parts and they just like, it, it works out for them. But that's not 98% of people's experience. 98% is right. like, you just have to do the work. You have to fall down a lot. You have to have these peaks and valleys. And I always tell people, I'm like, it's really sort of like the process and the work. Cause I'm like the result, it's sort of like, it's here and then it's gone. You know what I mean? You put out an hour of stand up, people watch it, and then it's like, okay, everyone's like, what what next? So it's very much you can't get so tied to like these 
sort of like moments of like, I'm going to win an award or I'm going to have a a New York Times bestseller. Like that can't, that's just not going to be as fulfilling as like the going and writing every day, the like, you know, making comedy friends, all of that stuff. And so I really feel like I wish people understood that doing the work and all the stuff of whether it's like studying stand up like if you want to be a screenwriter just reading like a lot of scripts like that is the stuff that's like nourishing and will allow you to be ready for the moment when you do break out because we often see people who want xyz and they get xyz and they do not have the skill set to handle the moment and so i always tell people like you just want to arm yourself with like knowledge with ability, with mental fortitude. I think that's also a thing. Like mental fortitude is huge. Yeah. People like want the things. And I'm like, you see it all the time where people come into Hollywood, they get chewed up and spit out because they're they're not ready. The turnover of people who move into LA and New York too. Mm -hmm. But I think LA is maybe, maybe worse because it's so visual and it's so like, external affirmations at least in new york some people like 50 percent of new york's like we don't give a shit <laughs> absolutely <laughs> right but in la people are like oh my god is that so and so at the coffee shop i'm like jesus <laughs> christ let, me, let those people live um so i completely agree with you and i guess i'm curious you know you said your inflection point that was really your inflection point for yourself mm-hmm. yes. i'm curious where you think your external mm-hmm. career inflection point was because to go from like having your whatever your vision of what you thought you were going to do be a writer go into film climb the ladder do the things and then say actually I'm going to be an artist and a performer and put myself out there a lot of people then just kind of could stop like Mm -hmm. you know you could just do that and like you're pounding the pavement and you're doing that grind and we may not know you today if that's where you had stopped so when did you necessarily decide to make an adjustment to get bigger like how did you make that leap because I think a lot of people get stuck yeah I think I was just sort of and I think I'm always kind of like this where I'm just like okay I know I want xyz I'm not sure how I will get there but I will just sort of show up every day and do the work and the path will sort of reveal itself Mm. and so you know 2008 when I started doing stand up and then really like sort of I was just you know another New York comedian just getting up you know doing biker bar shows in Staten Island taking the one dollar bus to Boston to sleep on comics couches and do you know shows where I don't make any money (laughs) but I think really sort of like this sort of like external moment was probably when Jessica Williams and I sold two dope queens to hbo because we were doing it and the podcast and i was like jessica i feel like we could get this on hbo and this was probably like (laughs) but like what a thing to say i feel like we should go on tv yeah well because like when the podcast came out april 2016 it just really like took off like it would like was number one on like the podcast charts on itunes it just really did well I don't yeah and I was just like you know the show just felt so good and fun and it was just great because we you know we're having people like Bo and Yang and Michelle mm-hmm. Buteau and mm-hmm. Shay Wang and just all these like really awesome people good on people. and I was just like I used to love I love variety shows. So I would think about like, you know, like comic relief or like whatever. And I was like, I haven't really seen like a variety kind of show like this on TV in a minute. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, I think we could like get in at HBO. And she's like, yeah, I feel that way too. And so we, you know, we invited them out. We invited execs out from other networks and they just completely got what we were trying to do. We want it. We don't want you to change anything. We just want to help support your mm-hmm. vision and mm-hmm. it was really nice to just have a network sort of get that. And so, you know, when we got on like HBO, that got the attention of ABC and they wanted me to do this pilot. And I liked the script. It wasn't a perfect fit for me. And they also wouldn't let me come on as an EP. And I just think as someone who's a writer and a creator, like I want to also be, you know, be like to able that. to help yeah. like shape it a little bit. Yeah. And so I was like, I think there are better people for this part than me. So Mm. I was like, I'll just like bow out and I'll just, you know, this was 2019. 
And they came back like a few months later and they're like, well, would you want to have like a production company under our umbrella? And I was like, oh, I think I like accidentally played like hard to get and it worked. (laughs) (laughs) That was not normal. Yeah. I was like, oh, I should do that in dating and see what happens for me. Um, I'm good. (laughs) And so that just really really changed everything was doing that special. Cause I think, you know, obviously Jessica was the more well-known person because of the daily show. And she had started doing some indie movies, you know, they were like premiering at Sundance. And so I was like really kind of the more unknown person because up until that point, I was just not just, but I was mainly, you know, a New York stand-up comic and a freelance writer. And so I just wasn't known on a bigger level. Mm. And so I think once people got to see the visual of me and see me be funny and be dorky and all those things, I think people were able to put it, it more together that I could, you know, have a place in this industry. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Like what what I heard you just say is you started off, then you got an opportunity because you put yourself out there and you invited people, which is like audacious, right? Like I mean, how many people have the thought of like, let me go just like get people's information and get my network and invite these executives. And then they show up. Okay. Then they show up and then they love it. And then you get this deal and now you're on HBO and now you're in everyone's house. Right. And so we all see you and we're like, oh my God, you and Jessica are so cute. So funny. So interesting. And there wasn't a lot of you. Like there were people, there was like Issa and some people on like Mm -hmm. YouTube, but not people hadn't made the jump yet. Like HBO hadn't become like very black. Yeah. Like stars wasn't very black. Like, you know, like it was, it was not normal at the time to see that kind of content on HBO. And then more opportunities came and you took advantage of that. Tell me at what point did you decide to hire a team? And it, when you started to explain who you were to the audience, you didn't say entrepreneur and business oh, yeah. owner, but you, you really are. And yeah. so I'm curious, at what point did you decide to like hire a team and, and really start to formalize the foundation for your empire? Yeah, I mean, my first assistant, I believe she started 2018. Her name is Mai, and she's fantastic. So it was just her and I against the world and, like, just a scrappy little duo. And then, you know, as I started building out the production company, then I hired, Mm -hmm. like, a head of development. And so Mm. then I want to say around, like, 2018, maybe I got a publicist and, you Mm -hmm. know, so you, along the way, it's like you start out with like getting a manager and then you get an agent and then you have a lawyer, you have all these things. And so you're sort of slowly building a team. And that's been very fun for me just because I really like to work with other people. And yeah. so now I still have the same agents that I signed with. This had to be like 2016 or 17. Mm-hmm. They're amazing. Tim, Heidi, Ali. And, you know, I think as a business owner, what I've learned, uh, it's been like a a journey, journey, like for sure. Because I think, you know, it's one thing to be a creative and I'm like, oh, I'm just writing and blah, blah, blah. And like, that's one thing, but like really writing a business and overseeing employees and making mistakes and having good quarters, having not so good quarters and, you know, managing expectations, all that stuff are things that no one's really taught. You're just like- Just kind of have to brute force it. (laughs) Yeah, you're like, oh, I want to be a boss. I want to be this. But then it's just like, part of that is like looking at the best dental plans for your company. It's like, I do not give a (laughs) fuck. Why am I reading this document? Yeah. (laughs) That's That's a major switch. When you go from like, everybody's a 1099 contractor and you're not really thinking about compliance to like, Oh, we have like benefits and policies and that yes. leave and like things. Yeah. It's so, a huge jump. It's a huge jump. And it's, you know, I always, I've talked about this with my therapist. I'm like, I consider myself a small business owner. Like my, mm-hmm. I have a team. Yeah. It's, there's four of us. You know what I mean? Right. Like I have my, my assistant, my head of development, and then like my chief operating officer. And it's, that's it. You know what I mean? Right. I think, you know, people see like, oh, she's had like New York Times bestselling books and right. You know, she said TV shows, like, Mm -hmm. oh, she's just like thriving and coasting and chilling. I'm like, dude, I'm in the trenches every day, you know, because it's my name on the door. And so I think being a small business owner, what I like about it is that you learn how to get 
good at so many different things Mm -hmm. and you learn to have sort of like that personal responsibility you know what I mean Mm -hmm. where I think sometimes when you especially like I've had jobs where it's like this is mine I mean it's whatever I don't care I'm gonna you know I'm gonna do my job but I'm not like I'm not mentally engaged or challenged enough and when you're an entrepreneur you're a small business owner you're engaged every single day you just can't help but be that Mm -hmm. so I feel like I really grown a lot as a business owner. I think especially in terms of tough decisions. I think I've always mm-hmm. struggled with that because I'm like, I always want everything to be, you know, I'm a Libra. So you want everything, you want everyone to feel good, everything to yeah. be like even and nice and chill. And I had to get to a place where it's like, oh, no, you got to be able to make decisions that like are going to benefit your your company. Right. Yeah. 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 That's an interesting adjustment. And I think when you're creative and you are making things put out into the world, and then all of a sudden you're a business owner and an entrepreneur where like the buck has to stop with you and you're responsible for other people's lives. You're responsible for their rent, their kids' dental plan, and if their kids get braces or not. And the challenge I think that I've heard from so many creatives is that it can feel draining to the point where how do you find space and time to be in your essence? Yes. And do you, do you have like rituals? Like, do you take like Fridays off so you can create, do you do like once a month you go on vacations? Like how do you incorporate your rituals so that you have space to be in your creative brain? Yeah. Usually my calendar will block out, you know, I use this app called Pomodoro where it's like you focus for like 25 minutes, break for five, blah, blah, blah. You repeat that. So I usually will block out time in my calendar for either, you know, script writing or stand up writing. And that helps a lot too. But yeah, there are days where it's like, I don't want to be in any more meetings. I need to just be over here creating. And so, you know, it's just, it's always a balance. There are days where it's like frustrating where you're like, you you just have to do like admin stuff. So it's like, well, this is just not going to be a day where I create. I just got to keep the lights Mm -hmm. on. Um, So I think I used to like struggle with the balance of that in the past. And I think now I'm just, I'm very much like, yeah, if I need to write today, like that's just what's happening. I, cause I used to be always like, oh, well I'll just move this for this. Or I was very notorious for like, I would build in time off. And then of course something, some opportunity would come up and I'm like, oh, well I'll just do the, the work opportunity. And so then I would just burn myself out. And so now I'm just like, if it's in the calendar, it's in the fucking calendar. Mm-hmm. So it's like, mm-hmm. unless, you know, like LeBron James is calling to hang out for brunch. I'm writing this <laughs> I'm, day. I'm doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> but it is hard because it's like, again, when you have employees, you also have to tend to them. Like you yeah. you can't silo yourself off because then they're going to feel disconnected and they're going to be like, well, what's this about? So you have to check in every day. You have to Mm -hmm. make sure they feel seen and heard and they're enjoying themselves and they're having a good time. So it is a tough balance. I think I'm getting better at it as I have sort of proven myself in this industry. I think it's allowed me to not have to do as many things at Mm -hmm. once, you Mm -hmm. know, because before I was like, I got to have a podcasting and this thing and that thing and this, Mm -hmm. because I don't know what's going to take off. And this year I feel like it's kind of the first year where it's like, it's very much a writing heavy year for me. I'm right. I'm working on a TV pilot script and write a new hour of stand up. Mm. I have an idea for a romantic comedy. So I'm going to start working on that mm-hmm. this summer. You know what I mean? So it's like, I'm able to take that breath, but it took a long time to get there. And I'm still always trying to make sure I'm not just as someone who's a writer, it's very easy for you to just be by yourself. It's yeah, like, it's, it's in a, in yeah. the right forest. Just yeah. <laughs> exactly but it's like your employees are like knock knock bitch come yeah. out the forest you know <laughs> <laughs> I know that's right <laughs> Facts. all day every day my employees like are you working I'm like no I'm not working <laughs> yes yes I am hello what do you need what advice would you give to the creative who's listening who feels like it's time for them to hire a team that they're like soloing it. Like maybe they're making six figures. So they've like quit their job. They're like full-time creative, but they're solopreneur for the most part. And the idea of like hiring someone feels intimidating. What advice would you give them? Yeah. I feel like when I hired, I was sort of at that point where I was getting very stretched thin and I was it's like sort of where you're like between levels, you know what mm. I mean? You're like, mm-hmm. you're here and then you're trying to get to the next level and you're like right here. And I was mm. just like, you know, 
emails are slipping through the cracks and, you know, I just feel like I'm just stretched too thin. And I was like, I think this might be the point where I should hire an assistant. Mm. And I would tell people like, it is scary at first to be like, oh, I'm going to hire someone <laughs> and I'm going to have to pay them. And it's like, you know, it's predicated on how I do because it's yeah. like, you know, if you just have like a nine to five job, it's like no one else's livelihood is on the line based on yes. your performance. Yes. So that is something I had to adjust to. And I was like, for me, it felt like hiring an assistant was investing in myself. Mm. And so I think that's how I was able to make it less of an anxious decision and less of something that was like filled with like concern and more of like, no, I'm slowly building out my business. And this mm -hmm. is the first step. And this means that if I can afford an assistant, I must be doing something right. Yeah. So I just right. got to keep going down that path. But mm -hmm. it's, I would say just like, you know, sit down and write out sort of the things that are going well in mm -hmm. your career, your business, and then write down the things that could be improved upon. Mm. And if it all sort of kind of seems like, yeah, you're trying to do everything. And so guess what? You're not doing everything well. Right. It's probably time to bring someone on. And, you know, I think by doing that, it also teaches you to not feel like you have to do everything yourself. Because I think a lot of small business owners, like that's the mentality is like, it's all on me. And yeah, I got to just like, handle business myself. And when you branch out, you have employees and they could take like that burden off. It's so rewarding and it frees you up so much to really focus on the reason why you started your business, you know, mm -hmm. which is to like you refocus on that passion, you know? And so I would say, do a gut check, write out where you want to be in a few years and write out why you're scared to make this next step. And then if you're just like, oh, you look at it and you're like, okay, well, I wrote all that stuff down. Mm -hmm. So it's not in my head anymore. Right. And it's like the worst thing that could happen is I hire someone and it doesn't work out. It doesn't really seem as scary anymore, you know? That's right. It's giving what we do in therapy. Yeah. <laughs> That's the worst case scenario. Yeah, because you, you build it up in your, Yeah, because you build it up in your mind. You're like, oh my God. And then when you're like, Oh, this is it? Like, it's not yeah. It's not that big of a deal. Yes. Literally, this is why everybody should go to therapy because you just <laughs> learn You just learn ways to trick your brain to taking action or not yeah. take action, depending on what you're trying to do. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, and I feel like it's so helpful just to get the mental exercises mm -hmm. when you're trying to move to a next level. I'm thinking sometimes when I do these podcasts, I always think about, well, someone who's listening in who's like annoyed with me because I didn't ask the question. Do you ever think about that? Yeah. We're going to think like, they're like, oh, well, why didn't you follow up on this, Morgan? And <laughs> I'm curious for you, as you approach this next phase, like how do you prioritize your, not retirement, but how do you prioritize when like you hit your threshold of enough mm. and how are you thinking about making that transition or are you thinking about like what that transition looks like for you? Yeah. I think for me, I think I'm going to be a person who's always going to keep working. Like I just mm -hmm. like to work. I like to create. So I'm like, I feel like I'm going to be on my Betty White, my Norma Lear, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Out here having fun. But I think I definitely have shifted priorities in my life. And, you know, mm -hmm. I was such a workaholic, but that was like the number one priority. And I was missing like weddings, baby showers. I wouldn't mm. go home to like visit family as much and all those things. And so now it's like, I take time out for friends and family and, you know, take solo trips so I can sort of like rejuvenate, mm -hmm. which I think will allow me to want to be in this industry for a really long time. Because yeah. I think when you're so used to like, oh, if I don't say yes, this opportunity is going to go away. Right. Then you get to a point where you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. This is just not fun. You sort of lose like why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And if you're just like, I'm just working, well, then what's the point if you're not going to enjoy, you know, the fruits of your labor? So I think now I'm in a place where I enjoy the work, but I also want to enjoy a little bit of life, yeah. um, which, so yeah, I'm not really thinking about retiring. I think, you know, as I get older, I definitely want to probably like 
really see if I can make this imprint like be something really huge. Like I really mm-hmm. like that it's, you know, we're we're three years old and we're mm-hmm. really and it's you know, with Harper Collins. Oh uh, no, no Penguin. Penguin. House. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Penguin House. And so we, you know, we're starting to build like our author retention, which is really great. Mm-hmm. We what like, does that we, mean? So it's like, you know, we have Grace D. Lee. She wrote um, Portrait of a Thief, and now she's writing another book for us. Got it. And then we have another author, Latoya Watkins. She wrote two books for us, and she's coming back to write two more books for us. And that's, like, really important for me, for authors to feel like this isn't a one and done, that I'm really Mm going to be there on the journey with them. Yeah. And so I definitely would like to lean more into that. And, yeah, I don't know. I just really love what I do. And so I just... Don't envision myself, you know, piecing out. Like, I really just feel like I'll just find different ways to to keep going. Although I mm-hmm. feel like stand-up, I, I don't think I'll be doing that forever. Because it's really just, uh, it's a grind. Like, just being on the road is a lot. And so, it's boring. Yeah, so I don't I don't imagine, like, doing that in my, like, I don't think I'll be, like, a Dick Gregory and still be Yeah, doing yeah, like, stand-up. literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Working. <laughs> Working. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what I, when I see like that generation still out and about, I'm like, y'all been working. I know. I do not aspire to work like that. (laughs) No, no. What advice would you give to creative writers who are looking to get published? I would say, I know this sounds like really obvious you're like duh but the first step is really like writing like I met a lot of people are like oh yeah I want to write and then you ask them like okay send me a sample they don't have one so it's like babe what are we talking about you want to be a thing but but not actually do the work yeah Yeah. I say that a lot though I see that with entrepreneurs they're like yeah so like I want to start a business and Mm -hmm. And I'm like okay but just like do it like what yes. why are we talking about this yes and so my thing like when I started I used to do recaps for scandal I would write I had my own little blog that I was writing I think four times a week like I was just long before anyone ever paid me or I sold a book I was just writing regularly and I knew I wanted to do essay collections so with my blog I would just like sit and I would write and blah 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 And like, so when I did get my book deal in 2015, I was able to be like, okay, yeah, I mean, I've been writing. So like, I can handle this moment. And, you know, when I met with my lit agent, Robert Gensler, who I'm still with to this day, and he was just like, here's some sample, you know, book proposals, go off and write one. And I just like read and I studied them and I just was like writing and rewriting it and rewriting it. And I just was really, again, a student. Like I was like, well, if I want this thing, like, this next level, I'm going from blogging to writing books. Like I got to study all these books. And so I, when I wanted to write essay collection, I think I read something like 30 essay collections, you know, like I read like Shauna Rhimes' book, Roxanne Gay. I read Girl Boss. I just read like any sort of essay collection, like David Sedaris, is just to sort of like, see like, okay, these are sort of the common themes or like, this is sort of like, oh, this person did this. This is really cool. This person did that. That's awesome. And so I really just became consumed by it. And so that is a huge part of it. I think also studying the industry and noticing like what trends are happening, I think is very important. It doesn't need to inform your work. You can write whatever you want, but it's, it is always good to see like, oh, this is what the industry is like sort of buying a lot of right now. I think you have a very data driven approach and I talk about data like a lot, like, mm -hmm. What you just said is very much, you took an inventory of everything that was out there. You said, I like this stuff. I don't like this stuff. This is the patterns that I'm seeing. And then you said, okay, now I have at least like a mental framework or outline on how to approach the thing. And I'm writing, finishing up my book, which comes out later this year. It's been such a process. Yeah. But similar to you, I've been writing newsletters weekly for many, many years, like four years, something great, like so long that the folder is just huge, (laughs) but I could just pull all the things, you know? And then when I was looking at titling the book, I asked my editor, I said, well, can you send me a spreadsheet of all of the top performing books Mm -hmm. in these two categories? Send me their titles, how much they did, how many books they sold, et cetera. And then I ran it through AI like a crazy lady and said, tell me the trends that you see from this data. And it was so fascinating, like the keywords in the titles, the colors of the book covers, wow, like actually yeah. how many trends there are. But to your point, it was about being a student. It was like, okay, 
some of the stuff is, of course, people are really, really good at what they do. And the book is fantastic. And like, that's why it's a perennial seller. But some of it is also like, they know how to play the game. Yeah. You yeah. know, they know what the people like. Yeah. And it's just about being ready for the, I think people always are thinking about the moment and not thinking about if they're going to be ready for it. Mm. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean that you're going to have, I mean, I don't think there's any situation where you're going to go into and you're like, I have a hundred percent of all the information I'm going to be like, it's not about that, but it's about like, if you're doing the work of like doing the data stuff, if you're writing the newsletters for, you know, four years, when you sit down to write a book, you're not going to be like, well, how do I write? I got this deal. How do I write a book? It's going to be more like, oh, I got to revise this essay again. When there's, right. there's all those moments where you're like, I got to fluff out this story. I'm like, how many more details? Yes. Do I, do? I don't remember what I was wearing. I know. <laughs> and your editor knows you're going to have an attitude with them, but they're yes, ultimately like, right. Yes. <laughs> what was, where were you when you came up with this framework? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember where I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think that like for me, I'm always like, I never want to go into is, and I think a lot of this just comes from the fact that, you know, as a woman of color, you're very much like, you know, you have to be on point. You have to know your ish inside out because when you're walking into rooms, a lot of times there are going to be people thinking you don't know what the fuck you're doing and you don't belong here. So I think that over preparedness sort of, you know, comes from that and also that my parents have a strong work ethic. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I just always tell people, I'm like, the only thing you can control is what you bring to a situation. Like Mm -hmm. you can't control if someone's going to buy your book. You can't control if like someone's going to want to represent you. You can't control if your TV show becomes a big hit, but guess what? You can control if you do the best writing job. You can can control whether you know how to be a producer and know how to run a set. Like those are things that you can control and they're not always the sexy things. Of course they're not like, you know, being like number one, the call sheet for everything's trash. I think people are just like, Oh, it's just like fun. You go to glam and blah, blah, blah. And like, whatever. And yes, you, there are those fun moments in hair and makeup, but it's like, you're in the chair learning your lines. Usually myself and my showrunner Jonathan Groff not the actor but the other Jonathan Groff like mm-hmm. we would be rewriting scenes because we'd be like oh this scene's too long mm-hmm. we could cut this in you, like in so real time <laughs> yeah in real time I'm like those are the things that you want to be prepared for and if you're taking shortcuts or if you don't want to be a student of the thing that you want to do to me that makes me question whether you really want to do the thing or do you just want the results from that? Like, if you mm-hmm. want to be successful, do you want to be famous? You want to have a lot of money? You could find some other career that's not the creative. <laughs> if you want yeah, that. yeah, you yeah. can try. This one's not the right one. And I, yeah. I mean, I would even argue, like, sometimes people want to have the title mm-hmm. and be known for the thing more than they want to put in the being a student. Yes. of that trade and have yes. a trade craft that they're excellent at, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I think anyone listening to this podcast probably is already in the learning journey. Like they're already love information. So I'm probably preaching to the choir <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> no, and, and then just constantly like learning, like right now I'm like calling this like my film school year. And I'm just like mm. trying to watch as many movies as I can mm-hmm. this year, just because, mm-hmm. you know, like, I, I wrote like a screenplay, but it was like in college. So I haven't like ri- really written a movie since then. So I'm just mm. like, you know, sort of like, oh, I'm noticing like things that Scorsese d- and I love Mars Scorsese. So like I watch all his movies, but now I'm like yes. watching with the eye towards of like, what can I learn from all these things? Or I just watched Celine Song's uh, Past Lives last mm-hmm. night, which I think is a really good indie movie. And so it's just like, you know, I've been in this industry for a long time, but I'm like, there's always more that I can learn. And yeah. so like, I'm taking this opportunity to be like, okay, I'm going to try and learn as much as I can about film in this mm-hmm. way and, and help that inform my screenwriting process later on this year. So it's right. it, the learning never stops. So yeah, you gotta, being, you gotta novice, love, yeah. Being on the, ner- the journey of always being a novice in something is yeah. like, for me, it gives me a lot of energy. Yeah. Same. I love it. Okay. Last question. What books, like fundamental skills books or Mm. like fundamental, like history of, you know, type of books would you give to a creative who wants to be on the same type of career path that you are? Someone who gets paid to be themselves, gets paid for their ideas and gets to live this life of a like fully encompassed creative. 
Yeah, I'm right now. I'm actually reading Rick Rubin's book. I think it's called A Creative Act. He's at. Oh, yes. Like, yeah, that's amazing. a top seller right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really good. It's one of those, like, you're not going to breeze through. It's more like you read, like, you know, 20 pages and you let it, like, sit with you and right. then you go back to it. But I think it's really, it's really smart, but also the EQ is also really high in that book. Mm -hmm. And what I really like about it is I think so often when you turn your passion into a business, Mm -hmm. you can lose the things that make you the most creative Mm -hmm. and make you sort of so focused on being results oriented on having a good quarter on doing whatever. And it's just sort of like, you're now working or creating in a pressurized environment when a lot of times the best stuff that's created is without pressure. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's by being free and not like sort of like judging yourself or Mm -hmm. it's just sort of like being in the moment. So I really like that book a lot. Brene Brown's all I think is good for that. It's great. Yeah. Cause again, I think she's also a data person too. So she there's is. a yeah, there's a lot of where you're like, I think I identify with that sort of creative mm-hmm. aspect of it. And then I think a lot of times I just like I really liked Shonda Rhimes' book because I thought, year you know, yes. the, the year of yes. Yeah, I think that's I don't live by a year of yes. I think, but just in general, like I'm very much a person. Mm. And I think that's because I started out doing improv at college where it's very much the fundamentally yes. And mm-hmm. it's not about saying no, it's about mm-hmm. building. And so mm-hmm. I think I'm very much creatively a person who will be like, all right, let's see if we can make this happen. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes people will be like, no, 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 no. And it's like, but what if it's a yes? What if we try? Like, how can we get to yes here? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. sometimes it's like, you know, it doesn't work out. And when it doesn't work out, you sort of always learn something. So it's worth it anyway. Um, and then if it does work out, great. But I really do think that what I, okay, I how can I explain this? Okay, so my niece and nephew, mm-hmm. my niece is nine, my nephew's five. Mm-hmm. My niece, Olivia, she is very bold and outgoing, really into science. Hmm kind of fearless in a way learning the guitar right now she's just very much kind of like I'm gonna just like go for it right Mm -hmm. and you know I know society will try to beat that out of her because that's what society does they like to beat that out of people Mm -hmm. and so I'm always of the mindset of like how can we get back to the place before we felt shame for being ourselves you know what I mean yeah that child energy yeah, because I think that's so important, not only just to for creating, but just for like living. You know, yeah. I feel like we we easily box ourselves in. We're like, oh, we shouldn't do this and we shouldn't mm. do that. And well, that's just like a, it's just a hobby. So like, what's the point? Like, I definitely feel like that's a very American thing where it's like, if you're not going to be super proficient, I think, do then why are you doing it? Yeah. And you're like, well, I'm doing it because it's like, I enjoy it. Like, you know, like I'm never (laughs) going to be the fastest runner. Like that's not the point. Like I'm doing the Boston marathon on Mm -hmm. for charity. Like I'm, I'm not trying to qualify for these things based on time. It's just like, if there's pleasure I'm getting from running and that's enough. And so I wish that we could all get back to a place. And I think creatively and as an entrepreneur, like if you can remember the pleasure you derive from the thing. Mm. when the stakes were low Mm. when the stakes get high I think that will sort of keep you from floating away it will anchor you in a way yeah 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 Yeah, I believe that I believe that 100 percent and I think that having things that you do for you for me that's painting you know people Mm. are always like are you gonna sell your paintings I'm like no I don't want to like I'll give you a painting I'd rather give you a painting than sell it yeah you know and maybe my second life when I'm 60 years old then I'm like all right let's do it but (laughs) for now it's an outlet you know it's an outlet for for space and thought and feelings and just like it's a creative outlet so I really do hope that people who are listening and like reconsider what their creative outlets are and not everything has to be 
for distribution. Yes, <laughs> yes. Not everything has to be built to sell. Like it's okay to just yeah. do something. Yeah, and that's the one thing I I dislike about social media because everyone's trying to monetize everything right now. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, oh, I love to cook, so then I'm gonna start a cooking channel, or I love to. It's like, just do something because you like it. That's yeah. it. Yeah, invite people yeah. over for dinner, and you don't have to take a picture. Yes, <laughs> yes, you could just like hang out and have memories and do a snapshot in your mind, and that's yes. like it. And yeah, I wanted to get back to that because I think with social media and all this other stuff where it's like, there's, I saw there's this thing who was it New York times, Washington post. I can't remember, but now there's like bookshelf. wealth. Oh, I saw that. Yes. With like bookshelf porn where people have like these aesthetic bookshelves. Yeah. And like, how did we get here? (laughs) And I get it. Cause I like to code, code, code everything. But like, if you walk into my apartment, I'm like the old, like they're starting to be just stacks on chairs. I'm like, that's the reality. That's what it is. That's your essence. Yes. I am the book stacks on chairs, girl. I'm like, you can't sit here. You can't sit here. Cause these are all the books I need to read. Like, it's just, you could just collect books and it doesn't need to be like a, a thing. Yeah, I know. I mean, we could just keep going on and on, but yeah, because <laughs> I really can't. Don't get me started. This has been so um, fun. I want to keep talking. <laughs> no, so fun. I feel like <clears throat> hopefully those of you who are listening in feel a little bit more free and that you feel a little bit more empowered to just do you. And for the creatives who are struggling with that transition between how do you become an entity with your creativity, but also create space for your creativity. I hope this episode was inspiring to you and like, just do the volumes of work that it takes with joy because it's what you love to do. It's a, it's a privilege, you know, and Phoebe, thank you so much for sharing some of that with us today. Thanks for having me, Morgan. This has been awesome. And everyone listening, like, just like stick with it. There have been so many times where I've doubted myself and I'm just like, you have to just like overcome those moments because I really do think like ultimately you'll be reward. Did, did you see that happen? Oh my God. Wait. <laughs> Why is it doing <laughs> that? We really had that. Right, now I have to go figure that out. I don't know how I did that. That was very, wait, can I do it again? Um, what is going on? I was like some sort of AI filter sound. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, everyone just keep following your dreams. And when it gets hard, just keep plugging along. Because I do really think people who stick it out get rewarded. You just do. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thanks for listening to The Journey Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave a review and head to our Instagram and YouTube to leave a comment. I look forward to hearing how this podcast has made an impact on your own journey.